Hi, welcome to the Gamesplainer. I'm Jeff the Gamesplainer and today I'm Gamesplaining The Phantom Treasures of Dracon. So this is The Phantom Treasures of Dracon. I've set the game up as a three player game. It can play up to six. It can play down to one player. The number of these coins changes with the number of players and that's listed just here. So the very first thing that happens is a roll of the dice to get the turn order and it's really the player who has the highest attack on their dice will go first. So orange has two, green has five, purple has six. So we'll be starting with purple, which is the phantom. I will use colors to talk about players rather than names, just because the colors are easier to see straight away and really quickly if you're not familiar with the phantom ethos. <clears throat> so this is the phantom or purple. He will be going first. He pulls it to place there. That gives turn order. So. The player closest to us, or closest to the camera, is first player and goes back from that. At the end of the first round, whoever is the furthest back on this track, which is the points track, is going to become the first player. So if at the end of the first round it looks like that, orange would become first player, purple and green would hold their positions. So I'd go orange, purple, green. Obviously if it's like that, it would be orange, purple, green. Or if it was like that, orange, green, purple. As a general rule, whenever you bring points in off the board, so these little tokens are worth one point each. These are worth points. Uh, the highest points out of one of them is four points, and then three and two. Uh, they are on the back of the token. There's a number of points. Whenever you take those tokens in, you'll add onto this track. Whenever you discard those tokens, you will remove from that track. And when you are removing from that track, you are allowed to remove more than you are losing. So if you have, for example, your play here, you can at any point move down that track. And what that does is gives you three actions instead of two actions. When you're here or here, it's two actions. When you're up to here, you're only getting one action. Uh, when I'm talking about actions, I'm talking about special actions as opposed to maneuvers. So the game will run, this game particularly, will run for six rounds. The reason is you have three rounds on this card, one, two, three. By the time you get to the end of this tile, you need to have achieved what is being asked for. There are a whole bunch of these tiles that can be put out. So this one's asking you to travel on a hidden path. Hidden paths are these dotted lines. If you've traveled on a hidden path by the end of that third round, then you will get the stuff up at the top here, which is two of these more tokens, which also gives you two extra points. If you haven't, then you will be giving an extra movement to one of your opponents. So you go for the blue thing. And then you go on to the next three turns and you need to achieve what has been said by that. So that's a dice battle. You need to have a dice battle. You need to be successful in that dice battle to win that and you'll get an extra movement. Uh, if you lose that, then you'll take those two negatives, uh, which is negative on life and negative cards as well. When we finish the sixth turn, that is the end of the game. You could have more than two of those tiles out. If you wish, you could have three, four. It doesn't really matter. It's up to you. In the rules, there is a suggestion for the number of tiles that is appropriate for each style of gameplay. This game does also play as a team game as well as the player versus player. Uh, I'm just going to do the player versus player rules. There is a little bit of change with the team rules. The main thing is that on the team rules you're doing the actions of both the people on the team or however many people there are. All of them will do their turn before the other team has their turn rather than going one 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 one. And the other thing is you can swap equipment if you're standing on the same location. So let's get into the game without any further ado. You have five cards in your hand. Some of the cards have this symbol. Some of the cards have this symbol. Anyone can play one of these cards, which are the attack cards, during an opponent's turn. You can, however, only play one of each named card. So he would only be able to play this card. He wouldn't be able to play that card and that card during an opponent's turn. That marker is talking about cards that can be used when a trap has been successfully or unsuccessfully, depending on which angle you want to take at it. But when a trap has actually attacked you, that 
is the only type of card that can be played from that point on. Other than that, you have five cards in your hand. You can play any number of cards out of your hand as a general maneuver. You can pick up these coins as a general maneuver. When you pick up a coin, you add one to your points on the victory point track. You can pick up an amulet for free. What is an amulet? At some point, these four rooms will come out onto the board. When they come out, they have two amulets in them. If this player happens to be standing on it, she can pick up an amulet, which then goes into that spot. There's one amulet left. Notice that there is one less amulet than the number of players that are playing. The points for the amulets will come to you immediately when you pick them up. So if you pick up one amulet, it's going to get you one point. Two amulets will get you three points. A third amulet will get you six points. And a fourth amulet would get you ten points. And you can remove as many victory point tokens as you wish. Uh, so if you have one of these tokens, you can put that back to move yourself back down one spot for each victory point token that you have removed. Notice that victory point tokens go here, they don't go back onto the board. Uh, if you happen to drop one of these, they will go back to the center of the board, not to where you're standing. And if you happen to drop one of these, they'll go back off the board. So you need to go back to the room to pick them up if that's what you wish to do. So those are the maneuvers. Now we have special actions. You have three of them to start with. If you have moved along the victory point tracker to here or beyond, you'll only have two of these actions. The maneuvers and the special actions can happen in any order, so you don't have to do all the maneuvers first. You can do a special action, then maneuver, or you can do some maneuvers, special action, not more maneuvers, etc. It's really a matter of what works with the way you're playing. Each of these special actions can only be taken once. The only one of these special actions that isn't a one-off is the move action. So if you wish to move from one node to another, that costs one special action. Because I've moved onto an orange node, I would need to straight away roll the dice. So I roll the room die, and that tells me what I'm being attacked by. So if you look up here, that's the wild dog. The effect is that I have to retreat and I take a hit. Retreating looks like moving back one node towards your starting location. But notice you don't need to resolve any node that you've moved on to, so I should be doing another roll whenever I've gone into that. I don't need to. But what I can do, so that's what would happen if I don't manage to defend against it. So I would now roll my die, look at the defense value, which is a defense of three, because that was an orange node, I would need a defense of four. So what I can do is play this card, which allows me to re-roll a die. So I can re-roll my die, which gives a defense of four, D4, which is pass. So I actually don't move down that, move back a node and take the defense, but that is now a spent card. The size of this die will do something slightly different to each other. If you were to Roll the giant cobra head. You would add one of these markers to your board and what that means is you're going to take a hit at the end of your turn from now on. If you roll that, that's the tripwire crossbow that gives you two hits. There's also the tiger, which takes a hit, but you also need to then discard three of your cards. And discarding those three cards is actually giving them to your opponents as evenly as possible. So if he was to have to discard three cards, he would choose which three. So you have that choice and give two to one of the players and one to another player. Obviously, if you don't have three cards when you get hit by the tiger, then you don't give out cards because you don't have any to give. The curse, you would get one of these markers, which means that you can only hold four cards in your hand, not five at the end of your turn. So you can obviously go above that with if you're given cards by other players, etc. But at the end of your turn, you need to discard down to the four or just pick up four rather than picking up five. The further towards the center of the island you go, the harder it is to beat those traps. So once you start on the yellow nodes, you only need a three plus on the defense to get past them. 
The orange nodes is a four plus, the red nodes is a five plus. When you go into the center, nothing happens. When, however, you pick up one of the masks, which will give you four points, that's when you need to roll for that mega effect. So the mega effect that he's getting hit with is a curse, and we look at this line, and it's basically adding more punishment, I guess, to the thing that's happened. So you take a two rather than a one, or minus two rather than minus one. You would take four hits of damage rather than two. You take one hit of damage and a minus one on your ability to do stuff. So where he is, he would only do two actions rather than three actions on his turns and also retreat that one. If on Wild Dogs, he would distribute his whole hand rather than just three cards. And he would also distribute one of his victory point tokens. Now, if he only has that one victory point token, he must give that to another player, which means that he is losing four points here and the other player is gaining four points. Or he loses a health and takes a minus two card. So he would only be able to have three cards in his hand from that point onwards. Now you'll notice I haven't talked about the sixth side of the die. That's actually a positive side. If you're in the center, then you actually would have to re-roll that trap. You cannot get that positive from being the center. If you're on one of the other spots, then you're gaining a coin and gaining a point. It's actually a benefit. So one in six that you'll get a benefit rather than a negative. Remembering, of course, that he has the ability to try to defend against. He's only got a D3 rather than anything else, he would need to have a defense of six or more to be able to actually defend against that. You'll notice that this player's health points has got down to zero. When his health points get down to zero, he faints. What does that look like? I'm glad you asked. A couple of things happen here. Firstly, he discards a minimum of two victory point tokens. So once again, if he only has this token and this token, he's got to lose both of them. So you really want to make sure you've got a few of these on your boards. So if that happens, you, you're able to get rid of them. He removes any condition markers. So these are all condition markers. They come off. He restores his health to the maximum level. He discards his current hand. So that's all these cards go into the discard pile. And then he picks up two cards. If he has some time left on his actions, he can continue doing his actions at that point, and then we'll pick up to the five cards at the end of the turn. There's only a couple of things that I haven't touched on. The first one is the towers, which are just here. Each of the towers has a number, one through six. When you move onto one of those towers, you're having a look for the number, so that's number five, he's just moved onto. So when you step onto tower five, you would be able to move to another tower and action that. So he might go form straight over there. He's moved on to tower three, pick up that token. He's moved to tower three, which is draw three cards. So he draws three more cards. And what you're doing on each of the towers is just here. Notice tower four is move to your base. So you'd move to the base and discover a sacred room. So you would then put the sacred room on there he would then pick that up and get the three victory points. If that happened to be his second action or he's used two actions, he can't use any more actions because he's just gone past this line. So as soon as you pass that, you cannot move more. If obviously he's used his third action and to do that last thing and get across the line, then that's not a problem at all. Within those special actions, the only one that allows you to use other towers or to move towers is tower five, the rest of them you just do what is on the board. So within the special actions, move is one of them. You can do that up to however many times you've got actions available. Activate a tower, that's a special action. So that's what we were just talking about with these towers. Take an idol, which we've just done as well. You can replace your hand, which is discard however many cards you have in your hand. So if he had three cards left in his hand, he could discard all three of them and replace them with three new cards or five, whatever his number of cards in his hand is, he's got to replace all of them to do that action. The other two actions that you can do are actions against other players. So if those two players happen to be there just picking a random location, there are cards that can be used. 
So up to two notes away, up to two notes away. That's up to two notes away. For the actual action, so you don't need cards for this one, you would need to both be on the same node and you can ambush. The way this works is each player would roll their dice. Let's say that the orange player is attacking purple. So we've got an attack of two against a defense of six, which means that the attacker has not won, but the winner of that attack will gain one coin from the loser, which also means moving the points tracker. The loser would also incur one damage. If the players were to do a heist, the winner would get to steal one token. So in this case, this one's tried to do the heist, but purple has won, so purple might steal that one, which would give him four points. One, two, three, four, and we'll pull that back to three, four points. But the winner also incurs two points of damage. And that's referred to as a dice battle. So you're basically rolling the dice against each other. One of you is the attacker, one of you is the defender. Just look at the numbers. If the numbers happen to be the same, the attacker wins on a tie. The other thing you'll notice is each player has one of these cards. This is a one-off use. It is a maneuver, so it doesn't cost you anything to use it. But whatever the writing on the bottom is, you get to do that as a one-off action. Once you've used that, just flick the card over to show that it's been used. Once you get to the end of the third action, we turn these around, I've already explained that, and then we go through the next one and we get to the end of the game. Whoever has the most victory points is the winner. Just quickly to finish up with, the co-op actions allow everyone who's on the same team to move at the same time. The manoeuvre position on the co-op is to do a tag in, which is if you have to attack an opponent, you can use the die of one of your allies, assuming that they are within striking distance of the opponent also. So if you have a card that allows you to attack someone two nodes away, if your ally is also two nodes away, then you can use their die instead of your own. The other issue is the special actions. Uh, we can do a transfer. So if you've got two guys standing on the same node as we currently do, the they can trade cards. Uh, you can only do that with one opponent. So if you've got all three people from the same team standing on the same node, you can only do that with yourself and one other player on that space rather than both the players. You can switch, which allows two hours to swap locations if they're one node away from each other. And that won't set off any traps if you use it. And the other one is hurdle, which allows you to uh, jump over someone who's on your own team who is one node away, but that will set off any traps that are on the landing position. I think that is everything for Phantom Treasures of Dracon. Please go ahead and watch my games play to get a feel for how the game actually plays. If you have any comments or suggestions, please write them below. If you have any games that you would like to be gamesplained, please shoot me an email to thegamesplanner at gmail.com. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter at thegamesplanner to keep up to date with the games I'm playing. Subscribe to my videos to keep up to date with the games that I'm gamesplaining. And until next time, enjoy gaming.